because you uh, Dale Hardin from, from our college. We do very short introductions. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, you lose That's good? I can go? Yeah, you can go. Okay, okay. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here again. Um, so some of you may remember that I gave a sort of a tutorial uh, talk a few weeks ago um, talking about normalizing RNA-seq data and then differential expression and what those methods are doing and, and how, we, how we use them and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some work that I've done on sort of classifying the assumptions. So um, really thinking carefully about how the, and this is all just normalization, it's not differential expression at all. So, um, so how we, um, uh, how the, the normalization techniques and the assumptions that go with them really are quite related to the biological experiment that, that is going on. And again, this is work with um, a student, uh, Kieran Evans, who's now a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and he definitely deserves the <clears throat> lion's share of the credit for this work. So. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about differential expression, but it is sort of the underlying um, uh, uh, cause of you know, why we're doing this to start with. Um, and and um, it fits in nicely. I feel like, can you guys see this? I feel like maybe if the lights were down a little bit. Um, uh, it is sort of, um, you know, one of the big reasons that, oh, that's much better. Yeah. Uh, the big reasons that we use this data, um, though uh, everything I'm going to be talking about with respect to the normalization techniques is also going to hold if, um, if you want to do something else with the RNA-seq data, you want to cluster your observations or you want to use PCA or something to look for variability, all that um, uh, still holds. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the gist of the experiment. Um, and we've got this RNA and we, um, we fragment it and transcribe it or sometimes we transcribe it and then fragment it and then we eventually get these reads and we map the reads to the genome, uh, to the reference gene genome and then um, we ask ourselves are those reads different in condition A as compared to condition B. Um, okay, so <clears throat> it's important as we go through this process to kind of think and this is going to come back to us a couple of times so so you know let's make sure we all are on the same page to think about what we're talking about when we're talking about those reads at the bottom. So what is a transcriptome? A transcriptome has a variety of different definitions in the literature. Um, sometimes it means all the RNA, all the RNA in the cell. Sometimes it means only the protein coding RNA. Sometimes it means something else, depending on sort of what the, what the researchers are thinking about. So, so that's important because when you're doing this differential expression comparison, you need to sit back and ask yourself, for condition A versus condition B, am I interested in expression as a relative um, expression value, the number of reads per transcriptome, or am I interested in an absolute expression quantity, the number of reads per cell? Now, generally, we think about differential expression, DE, um, as expression per cell. We're interested in knowing in that experimental condition B, is there something happening such that there's more regulation, as more regulation in an absolute sense in the entire cell as compared to condition A. But this other, this other aspect might be something you're interested in, and it's something that we need to be careful that we know how we're measuring it and which of these we're measuring. Okay, so again, I'm going to use sort of the standard definition of differential expression, which is a change in the amount. And I'm going to actually go to mRNA here, um, though uh, nothing changes if you change what type of RNA you're working with. Um, is there a difference in the amount of mRNA per cell produced under the two biologically or the two experimental conditions? Okay, so how do we do differential expression? Um, we have to measure the gene expression, then we have to normalize it, and then we have to do this hypothesis testing step. And um, today's talk is all about number two there. So we're going to be thinking about how do we normalize. 
OK, so um, I gave this quote uh, when I gave my talk a few weeks ago, but just to kind of reiterate that the greatest impact on differential expression detection, um, according to these researchers and, and um, other, other people have seen it as well, is the choice of the normalization procedure. OK, a few more things just to uh, get definitions of. So the library size um, is, is related to the transcriptome, right? But it's, um, but it's talking about your sample. Instead of the cell itself, it says, how many reads did we map in the sample that we took, in the sample that we sequenced? So it's like the total number of these little rectangles, these little boxes down here. And it's important for us to think about, how do we get those reads? Why would there be these reads? Well, OK. Um, one way that we could get those reads is if we left the sample in the sequencer. So it'll just keep sequencing. And, and of course, we have experimental protocols that say how long we're going to leave it in. And you know we try to have our lab conditions be exactly equivalent. But there's going to be technical variability. And we have no interest in technical variability. We want biological variability. right? We want there to be lots of reads be, or we want there to be reads, I guess it doesn't have to be lots, we want there to be reads due to the expression in the experiment, not just due to the fact that we left it in the sequencer for a long time. So these are things that we, um, we have to keep in our, in our minds as we normalize and as we think about how we're normalizing this. There are certainly other factors that lead to uh, you know, lots of read counts or a dearth of read counts, um, but that are gene specific. So if we're doing differential expression, then um, you know, if we're comparing condition A for condition B, well, the gene length is the same. The GC content in, those, in that one gene across these two conditions is the same. So for differential expression, these gene-specific characteristics are not particularly um, relevant. Um, there's lots of ways to normalize according to, to gene-specific things. And typically, what's done is um, a normalization like I'm talking about today, and then an additional follow-up um, uh, normalization due to uh, gene characteristics. OK, so that's the extent of how, I'm gonna, of how much I'm going to talk about that. OK, so I've already given the slide. Um, I just want to reiterate that it's that top thing, which is the population value, which is what's going on in the cell that we want. And we have the sample values. And so we've got ideas of um, variability that are just sort of natural variability, um, along with technical variability and biological variability. OK. So <clears throat> I'm going to walk through a couple dis different examples that we've seen in the literature that um, really are these extreme examples that help us understand what's going on with the normalization techniques. And you might sit here and say, well, my data aren't that extreme. right?" I'm going to give you a handful of very extreme examples. Here's just three of them. Um, and while your example is probably not as extreme as what I'm going to be talking about, it is relevant for you to kind of think, OK, well, do my data behave in any of the ways, or do my experiments behave in any of the ways that we're talking about with these extreme examples? OK, so <clears throat> here's a couple of studies where they saw the vast majority of the reads due to a few genes. OK, so this first one, over 50% of the reads came from a single gene, right? The second one, 50% of the reads in 5% of the genes. And the last one, 50% of the reads in, in uh, a handful of genes, depending on the samples. So what happens then when that's going on? So let's say that is the case in the cell. This first um, picture here, picture A, I'm going to show a lot of pictures like this, so we should get to know this picture, says, OK, what if in the cell, in condition A, there's just sort of this baseline expression level. And in condition B, we have a baseline expression, plus we've got one gene that's like going crazy. All right? So this is a simplified version, but it's not unheard of, right? We've, we're definitely seeing this, that, that people are seeing this. OK, so what happens? Well, what I'm seeing in the cell is this, this um, non-differential expression of the green and the blue. But then when I look at the proportional shares, right? so when I start measuring per transcript, or when I 
um, when I normalize with my library size, okay, what I see is that the green, blue, and purple each take up one third of the reads in condition A. And in condition B, the green and purple, the green and blue take up half of the reads, and the purple takes up, sorry, a quarter of the reads for the green and the, and the blue each, and the purple takes up half. Okay, so when I look per transcript instead of per cell, I sort of see these proportional differences. Even though if I'm only interested in which genes are being expressed more, the purple is the only one. So this is my truth here. This is what I'm trying to recover. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so, so what happens if I don't normalize my data at all, then I, uh, then I see, um, then I see sort of more, more um, reads in the purple and fewer reads in the blue and green, assuming that I, um, assuming that I uh, sequence the same number of reads in both of these samples. Similarly, if I divide by the library size, that is the total number of reads, and I have this proportionality, I get, I get this, um, that the blue and the green look downregulated from condition A and the purple looks upregulated from condition A. And this we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Or uh, equivalently, um, I did this fold change of A divided by B. So that means that the blue and the green are upregulated in A, and the purple is downregulated in A. Okay, so if we don't normalize, or if we normalize by library size, then what we're doing is we're sort of measuring per transcript instead of per cell. And we get this upregulation in the non-differentially expressed genes. And we get the appropriate downregulation, or we get um, it's appropriate that it's downregulated. We might not see the extent to which it's downregulated in the purple. OK. Um, I'm going to come back to that. OK, so, so this is sort of the first class of assumptions. So we have these methods, which are total count. That's, that's just um, dividing by the library size, right? the number of reads, so that it's an apples to apples comparison. RPKM, probably many of you are familiar with. That's just like the total count, just like the library size, but it takes into account the gene length. Okay? And that, again, will give us very, very equivalent um, results because we're doing differential expression, so we're doing a gene by gene comparison. So it's, it's just going to be like you multiplied each gene by a different constant. So that'll be fine. And then FPKM is the fragments per kilobase um, per million reads. And that's um, also very similar to reads. All right, so here's the assumption. Right here, this last sentence, each condition has to have, has to have the same amount of mRNA per cell. That's what has to be going on in the experiment. And that's not going on. Right? That's not going on in this experiment because in condition B, there's just more mRNA in each cell. All right? So in order to get the correct normalization using total count, if we're going to divide by total library size, then we need to have the same mRNA per cell in our, in our um, experiments. OK, so here's an interesting example. <coughs> Various researchers, this is mostly microarray data, found that in aging yeast, we get a handful of genes that are upregulated, a handful of genes that are downregulated, so about equivalent proportion of each. But then later, we realized that the amount of histones decreases substantially as cells age in yeast, and that causes increased transcriptional activity across the entire genome. So this causes, aging in yeast causes global upregulation. But there were lots of people finding, again, you know, using microarrays, finding that the, the proportion of upregulated and downregulated genes were, were roughly similar. Well, using spike in controls to normalize, they were able to see that what was happening was this global upregulation 
that then was being normalized to come all the way down and just a little bit of variability here and there. What does that picture look like? It looks like this. Okay, so in condition A, we have some kind of regulation. When we get global upregulation in condition B, we see that everything goes up. Well, if we normalize using, using transcriptome, using library size, well, then the normalized read count looks the same. Of course, you know, um, I'm making these pictures look quite simplified from, from the, real, uh, the real scenarios. There'll be some ups and downs, and of course, there's lots of variability, you know, just kind of that natural piece. But, but in a simplified way, um, th then we observe that there's no fold change when, in fact, everything is upregulated. And again, this is A over B, so downregulated in condition B. So how do we work with spiking controls? Well, um, if we've got a spike in control, we can, we can normalize by that value. So we can multiply, we can talk, that we can use the, the factor due to that spike in value to say, okay, well, this is how much is due to all those technical variability pieces. Okay, so that purple spiking control will allow me to say, okay, the technical variability in condition A and the technical variability in condition B, let's set these things equal and use that factor, that multiplicative factor to, um, to, to multiply by all of the genes and we see this, we see this upregulation. Now, of course, there's lots of technical assumptions or uh, um, just underlying assumptions with respect to controls and spike-ins. The controls have to exist, right? It's not always true in every single experiment that you can just put controls in. Um, and they have to behave as, as expected. So for example, in that previous, um, that previous slide, in experiment B, the purple has to be the same expression level as it was in condition A. Right? So, so if it's a negative control, that means that there's nothing about experiment B which is causing upregulation or downregulation. Additionally, and maybe this is um, more important in terms of what we're, what we're working with in terms of these technologies, is that the technical effects have to be the same. Right? If I leave in my control in the sequencer for a long time, it has to keep getting sequenced just like my just like my other genes, right? Or whatever it is that, the that are, that are um, causing changes that are with respect to these technical effects, um, they have to act in the same way with the spike in genes, with the housekeeping genes, whatever it is, um, as with the, the rest of the genes that I'm interested in experimentally. Okay, so, um, so here's an example where, um, where we had an issue of uh, global down regulation, and um, and so so these researchers found found that in these uh, dormant tuberculosis populations that there was this global down regulation, but then they decided that actually what was more interesting was relative expression. Okay, so what they're seeing is this global down regulation, and they get it. Everybody believes like we're we're on board. But now let's ask the question, okay, are there some genes that are getting downregulated more than the baseline global downregulations? Or are there some genes that are getting downregulated less than the baseline downregulation that's being caused here? Right? So, so maybe you go back and you go, oh, actually, I understand those effects, but I'm really interested in normalizing by library size because I want to know sort of that transcriptome level uh, normalization. Okay, so, so this is what I've been talking about the whole time, but um, let's just take a step back and think what we're doing here. So the idea of normalization, the whole reason we normalize, is because we want genes which are not differentially expressed to be apples to apples. All right, so we want any sort of technical effects that are going on with the machinery 
to be the same for the non-differentially expressed in genes in condition A as they are with the non-differentially expressed genes in condition B. Because, of course, measuring gene expression is not like measuring a cup of flour. It's much harder. We have to think about what's going on. And, of course, they're also not going to vary with biological condition because these are non-differentially expressed genes. Right? The differentially expressed genes we want to vary by biological condition, but not the non-differentially expressed genes. So the gist of all of these methods is to divide by a number, okay? by a number related to that sample, where that sample was the thing that went into the machine and came out with these numbers. So there's a sp sample specific size factor that gives me this idea, which is that the non-differentially expressed genes vary due to things that vary in nature, but do not vary due to library size or biological condition. So if I knew my differentially expressed gene, I mean my non-differentially expressed genes, this problem would be solved. Right? If I, if I had all my non-differentially expressed genes, then I could just say, well, let's make sure they're sort of on average about the same, multiply by this number that we're trying to multiply by, and, and we're good to go. We can sort of then start to think about the differentially expressed genes. But of course, the reason we're doing the analysis right, is because we don't know which ones are the non-differentially expressed genes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing that. Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides here to talk about how we can have non-differential expression, or rather, how we can have differential expression. So here's, um, here's a lovely scenario where everything sort of works. All the normalization techniques work really well here. And I call this symmetric differential expression, where um, in both conditions, there's the same amount of mRNA per cell. So you see in condition A that the first two uh, genes, so there's just six genes here, right, given in the same order. So in condition A, the first two genes are upregulated, and in condition B, the last two genes are upregulated. Or I suppose you could say they were downregulated in condition A, um, but I'm going to write them like this, draw them like this. Okay, so this is symmetry because out of all the differentially expressed genes, half of them are upregulated and half of them are downregulated. That's the symmetry part, is the proportion that are upregulated and the proportion of downregulated. And they have the same mRNA per cell, right? Because here what we're measuring on these plots are, is mRNA per cell. Okay, picture one, that one's lovely. Okay, so now we've got symmetry because we have the same proportion of upregulated genes versus downregulated genes, but you see that in condition B, the upregulated genes in condition B, which are maybe the downregulated genes, are fourfold instead of twofold. Right? Twofold upregulated, fourfold downregulated. So that's where we're going to run into that total count normalization from before when we have this really different mRNA per cell across these conditions. Of course, we can have asymmetric differential expression. So here, out of all the differential expressed genes, three quarters of them are upregulated, and one quarter of them are downregulated. These plots make sense? Okay, but we have the same amount of mRNA per cell. Right? The same total amount of mRNA in each cell because we have this fourfold upregulation or fourfold downregulation um, in that asymmetric case. And of course, we can also have asymmetric differential expression with different amounts of mRNA per cell. So, again, what we're trying to do is find these genes. Uh, well, here, there's only one. No, uh, two. Sorry. Right? We want to find these two genes that are not differentially expressed, <clears throat> and we want to use those to get our library sizes apples to apples. Okay, so um, 
So back to this picture, kind of thinking about this correct normalization, how would we do it? Well, if we could just find either those blue or green genes and, and, and uh, just divide by the blue gene, divide by the green gene, then the blue gene, the green gene would have a, a value of one, right? Because they have the same read and, and we'd be good to go. Okay, so we could divide the entire sample by the blue gene, divide the entire sample by the blue gene. Let me say that one more time in a, in a more succinct way. You take sample A and you divide every gene by the value of the blue gene. Okay, so now in sample A, you've scaled by this numerical quantity and the blue gene's value is one. Now you take sample B and you do the exact same thing with the value of the blue gene in sample B. So you've scaled by this factor and now the blue gene in A is the same as the blue gene in B because they're both equal to one. All right, so what we would like to do is divide by the median read count in each sample. The median read count will now be one. And in this case, it's gonna work for us. When we have that one sort of crazy overexpressed gene, most of the genes will be differentially expressed. In fact, the median gene should be non-differentially expressed. So scaling using that median gene should be a way of normalizing that will work. Okay, another way of normalizing is by uh, DE-seq normalization. So DE-seq normalization does something very similar, um, but uses, instead of just the median value, it uses uh, the median divided by sort of a reference, um, a reference sample, let's call it. Now, ideally, what we would want is to divide by um, the median of the non-differentially expressed genes. Okay, right, so I've said ideally there in red, and here, this equation, I would say the non-differentially expressed genes. Okay, so, so that's that sort of, you know, multiplicative factor that's gonna give me the apples to apples comparison. Okay, so, so um, this is great, but it's not quite DE-seq, partly because we don't know, right? We don't know what this set is. Right, because that's why we're doing this in the first place, is to figure out which of the genes are differentially expressed and which of the genes are not differentially expressed. Otherwise, you know, there would be no reason to do this. Okay, so here we go. So, um, so let's see, what happens if we do this? Um, here, I've given you an example where uh, this is not um, mRNA per cell, it's the number of reads that were aligned, okay? And I've told you that the blue and the purple genes are not differentially expressed. So the blue and the purple are the, the first and last. And you can see that the size factors are off by a factor of two. Okay, so right, so this green gene, or rather this green gene is twice as big as this one. And this purple gene is twice as big as this purple one. So what we'd like to do is just to divide this by half, divide this by two, and boy, then that, that middle blue one is gonna be way differentially expressed, right? Because we're gonna you know, shrink everything down. How does this work? Um, you just plug in some numbers. I've made up these numbers to be quite lovely. Uh, and, um, and you get that this ratio of size factors is exactly two, which is what we want. Um, I was gonna say something else. Okay, but again, the idea that we can't actually do that because we don't know what the diff non-differentially expressed genes are, well, it turns out that most of the time, the median of the non-differentially expressed genes is really close to the median of all the genes. And now we're going back to those pictures that I was showing you about symmetric differential expression versus asymmetric differential expression. Okay, so when we get to asymmetry, then we're thinking, oh gosh, is this gonna be true, right? So what am I, what am I dividing by? Which, which one? Well, DE-seq2, or DE-seq and DE-seq2 use the same normalization. They, they use all genes. And they have to use all genes because they don't know which ones are differentially expressed and which ones are non-differentially expressed. Okay, so we've done some simulations to talk about um, the effects of these, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but I have one more normalization to show you, which is called DEGES, Differentially Expressed Gene Elimination Strategy. 
So this is a method where um, we normalize, that's step one, using all of the genes, using whatever method, doesn't actually really matter, um, and then perform differential expression. So after we've normalized, then we perform differential expression, and then we say which ones were non-differentially expressed. Okay, out of the ones that are non-differentially expressed, I'm going to then use those to go back and repeat my normalization step, and I'm going to iterate steps two and three there repeatedly. Now, it's, it's important, there's some nuances here that I'm not really going to get into, but it's important to normalize just a pre-specified number of times as opposed to, so, so iterate a pre-specified number of times, use the final normalization factor, and then go to your official differential expression. Um, this sort of pieces here are, are, uh, are done very um, um, uh, thoughtfully in order to control type 1 error rates. Right? We don't want to, um, we want to sort of have these be separate things, okay? Because otherwise what we're going to be doing is we're going to be just normalizing so that we can uh, get the most differential expression or, or something like that, right? We want the normalization piece to not have anything to do with our differential expression. We want it to have to do with our library sizes, right? So, okay. Okay, so then... Um, there's a, a handful of methods here um, that, that I've talked about a little bit. Uh, I don't really have time to go into each one of these separately, um, but they all sort of have this requirement of balanced expression. All right, so balanced expression meaning, meaning there's roughly symmetric differential expression across conditions. So that the proportion or the number of differentially expressed genes, sorry, the number of um, upregulated genes is about the same as the number of downregulated genes. And, and I'm not talking about the amount of upregulation, right? Amount of upregulation affects total count normalization. But here we're talking about the proportion of, of upregulation. Um, and, and uh, you know, we sort of back to this idea of these technical effects um, due to are, are similar across these two types of genes. Okay, so, um, so this is just, again, a, a summary of, of, of the way that, the way I think about these different normalization techniques. We have library size. We have where we're, where we're um, dividing by sort of a quantile. Um, and then these, these next four, DEC, cuff diff, TMM, median ratio, probably a lot of you are familiar with those. Um, that's just this ratio of sequencing depth, trying to get that to be similar across all of them. Um, Poisson seq is similar to DEGES, where you're finding non differentially expressed genes. And then we have these ideas of these spiking controls. RUV um, has, a, has three different types of normalization with it, and one of them works really nicely with the spiking controls to, um, to uh, uh, think about the variability of the spiking controls. Okay, so this has a lot of words in it, and it just means this. So we're going to do these simulations. Maybe I'll go back to that side in a second. We're going to do these simulations. I'm going to show you some results from some, um, from some simulations. And um, we did them under four different conditions. All right, so the four different conditions we did them under was symmetric differential expression, where we have the same mRNA per cell in each condition. Symmetric differential expression, where we had a different amount of mRNA per cell in each condition, meaning that the, you know, either the upregulation or the downregulation was a lot more. Asymmetric, where, um, where in order to have the same mRNA per cell, we needed one of the uh, regulations to be a lot more, one of the upregulations to be a lot more. And asymmetric um, differential expression, where we have differing amounts of mRNA per cell, and there we've just kept it at twofold. So that's what this slide says. See, it says 50%, so this is the symmetry, 50%, 50%, twofold, some of these are fourfold, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so um, just to kind of keep us on the same page, um, differential expression uh, is the amount of mRNA per cell produced under these different conditions. 
And um, what we're really interested in is understanding the population values. And of course, what we have are the reads in the sample. OK, so with that in mind, we can apply a, a differential expression method. In this work, we just use DEC2. It's, um, it's, uh, in the literature, it's one of the most, um, most applied differential expression analysis tools. Um, and, um, and, and that wasn't, again, the focus of this, so we wanted to keep that um, the same for everything. We did a simulation where we had 1,000 genes two conditions, this A, B condition that I've been talking about, five samples for each condition, so 10 samples total. Um, again, we applied DEC2 for the analysis. But really, the key thing we were looking at was the proportion of the statistically significant genes, which we knew were actually not differentially expressed in the population. OK, so, so right, we're doing a simulation. So, um, so we know which genes are, uh, are differentially expressed and which aren't, because we've set them to be such. Okay? And we've set them um, under these conditions. Okay? So four different scenarios about you know, how we're fourfold or twofold, what proportion, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and we're going to ask ourselves, OK, when I get the differential expression analysis, I have a bunch of small p-values which of those small p-values are actually coming from null genes? That's the idea. OK, so we're going to start here. And this is the scenario. But then you ask me, out of those 1,000 genes, how many of them are differentially expressed? Well, I'm going to vary that parameter also. But no matter how many differentially expressed genes I have, half of them will be upregulated and half of them will be downregulated. OK, so we're going to have a lot more genes here, but half of them will be up and half of them will be down. OK, so here's what we get. So on the x-axis, we have the proportion of differentially expressed genes. So I have 1,000 genes in the simulation. So here at 0.5, I'm saying that 50% of my genes are differentially expressed. Because I'm in this symmetric differential expression scenario, I know that 250 of them are upregulated, 250 of them are downregulated, and we're, we're um, upregulating them twofold in condition A, upregulating them twofold in condition B. Okay. Now, this is just sort of a baseline plot to kind of get us thinking about what happens. Um, there's a few caveats here that really have nothing to do with my work, but, um, but might be questions that you have in your mind right now. Um, for example, if we want a false discovery rate of 0.05, if we set DEseq to have a false discovery rate of 0.05, why is it at 0.12? So, um, so that is because of um, the way the default DEseq2 um, method calculates a dispersion parameter. So this is actually something that's known in the literature. So anybody who's curious about DEC2 having an inflated false discovery rate due to the dispersion parameter, I recommend you, you know, do some Google searching there. So there are ways to change that dispersion parameter to come down. But we decided to use the defaults in that method simply to kind of have a, have a comparison that, um, that would be useful to other people using these methods. So um, we have six methods here for, um, for using those differential, uh, for using, for normalization. And um, I don't know how, if you can see it all, but, but this third one here, the, the green one, is the oracle, which just means the truth. We know it because we simulated the data, right? We simulated these to all have different library sizes. All the samples have different library sizes. That's just going to be a random variable that comes from that. But we keep it. We know what it is. So we can divide by that number. OK, so the oracle is as best as we could ever think about doing uh, when, we're, when we're trying to find that constant to divide by. OK, so the oracle is going to be your baseline. One other question you might have when, um, when thinking about um, this plot that, again, has nothing to do with our work is why it goes down like that. Well, it turns out when you think about false discovery rates, the false discovery rate actually is controlled at the number you put in, which in our case was 0.05, times the number of, uh, the number of null genes over, um, over the, uh, the total number of genes in the sample. 
Okay, so it actually gets stricter control on it as you have, because it's like the, it's like 5% of the non-differentially expressed genes, or 5% of, mm, it's like one minus 5% times the non-differentially expression. Okay, but this, this is also expected to come down like this. Your false discovery rate actually gets, gets more control as you have fewer genes, fewer, um, um, fewer non-differentially uh, non expressed genes. Okay, so, um, okay, trying to use this graph to, to make sure everybody's on board with what's happening. Um, it might be worth pointing out that this pink one is total count normalization, which um, though is not sort of systematically awful, does do a little bit worse than everything else. Um, and this one is Poisson seq, which does that iterative thing, um, finding the differentially expressed genes. And when you have mostly, mostly differentially expressed genes, right, then it's hard to normalize by the differentially expressed genes because you uh, don't have any non-differentially expressed genes. Yeah? And the red method also does an iterative method? Yeah, the difference is that the default with Poisson seq is that it forces you um, to use, uh, I think it's 50%. You know what I mean? So the DEGES doesn't actually force you to say which ones are the, um, how many, what proportion. So, so Poisson seq, I think you can adjust that parameter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, this asymmetric uh, scenario, which we know should be okay for total count, but not okay for that sort of bulk of the middle ones that are always trying to get that median. Right? They're always trying to figure out, okay, which are the non-differentially expressed genes? Well, let me look in the median group, right? But if we've got this asymmetry, then that might cause us trouble. And this is what we see. So, um, so total count normalization, which has a super bad rep, right, actually doesn't do that badly. It's this pink one. But these other ones... Right? All the other four, and again, this green is the oracle. That's the one we know is the truth, whatever. Um, uh, you know, this is 40%. So that's saying out of all the small p-values, 40% of them were null genes. We're not differentially expressed in the population in the simulation I set up. Now, um, again, your experiment might not be this extreme. Right? This is a large proportion. This is 75% here. This is a large proportion of differential expression. Right? So, so we're back to those scenarios with global upregulation. And when you have global upregulation, then it's really hard to do any kind of normalization unless you have spike in controls or some other way of, of controlling. But, you know, I don't know, right? Like, we're still talking about if we have half of our genes differentially expressed, then we're still talking about a 20% false discovery rate, which is pretty high. Okay, so um, symmetric with different mRNA per cell. All right, so this is the case where, um, where you have some genes, half of your genes are upregulated, half are downregulated, but that the downregulation is at a different sort of magnitude than the upregulation. And we see total count, as expected, can't handle it, right? Total count, where we need that same mRNA per cell, is really struggling to control the, um, control the false discovery rate, even with not that many genes differentially expressed, right? Even when we've only got 10% of our genes differentially expressed, it's still not able to control that. And these uh, suffer from some of those same things that, that um, that regardless of the symmetry, if, um, if we're forcing it to, to do the normalization with the 50% 50, 50 of least differentially expressed, but there's more than 50% differentially expressed, then you're going to run into trouble. So we're, uh, that's not surprising with the Poisson seek there. Okay, and then last one here, we have asymmetric, but different mRNA per cell, and what you would expect, sort of everything, uh, everything kind of gets that false discovery rate um, much higher than we would want, that we're not controlling our false discovery rate at that 5% level, which is what we're trying to do. All right. Um, those are just, I don't, you don't need. Okay, so some take home methods here. Um, different circumstances calls for, for different normalization methods. 
if, if differential expression is de defined as RNA, mRNA per transcriptome, then you should normalize using library size. That's the right thing to do, right? But if it's not, then total count normalization might not be the right thing to do. If you have any concerns about that mRNA per cell, right? If you understand what's going on in your scenario and you're expecting the mRNA per cell to be much higher in one condition or much lower in one condition, then total count normalization is probably not what you're gonna want. If you have spikins that you believe, then you should use them, okay? They really help with a lot of these, um, a, a lot of these ideas of trying to get at, um, uh, at those baseline non-differentially expressed genes. And again, I think I mentioned this, that RUV um, has, has a method for, for working with the spikins in a modeling sense um, to, to improve that normalization even more. Okay, so, um, Clearly, the correct normalization depends on, depends on the biological experiment. And incorrect normalizations can lead to downstream problems. And I have really focused, just for the, um, just for the sake of clarity of a one-hour talk, on the two-condition differential expression case. But um, the underlying mechanisms are true no matter what you're doing, right? The underlying mechanisms of normalizing um, you know, by mRNA or by, uh, by library size or uh, normalizing by median, those are what's gonna give you the apples to apples comparison. So again, if you're interested in using your mRNA data, your, your RNA-seq data for clustering or for PCA, then you're still gonna run into trouble because, because your values, your expression values that you're working with are not accurately reflecting the mRNA per cell that you'd like it to be. And so however you measure sort of downstream problems, you know, are, that, that, that any method that you're working with is, is going to be, um, uh, it's going to have these issues. Um, so, you know, again, I, I uh, wrote this talk and we wrote this paper and whatnot for, um, for with with a handful of these extreme examples, and I understand that not every uh, not every experiment is quite this extreme. But but I also hope that you believe me that our examples are not you know made up or um, or or that crazy, right? So so keeping in mind that these are actually thinking things that are happening biologically. Um, another example that that I didn't talk about today um, has to do with CMIC and that CMIC has a way of upregulating everything or downregulating everything um, as a transcription factor. So, um, so those RNA-seq uh, those RNA-seq data sets um, uh, have really had to been thought through carefully about how to use them. Um, right, and none of these normalization methods are perfect, right? They all have their own shortcomings and, and we have to think carefully about them. Um, but that, again, with this, with this sort of classification ideas and kind of understanding the mathematical pieces to what's going into the, uh, the, the size factor estimate, right? If we understand the, the technical mathematical aspects, um, then that gives us a lot of, uh, of, of thought into how the normalization method connects to the biological experiment and which one of these is sort of most appropriate for how we're gonna be using our own data. And I think that is all I have. Thank you very much. Questions?